and welcome to Q Today. I'm Allison Duddy. And I'm Nate Bellow, and this is our show for April 5th. Did you have a good break? I had a great break, Nate. I know, and I know all about <laughs> it, but we're going to keep it for a secret for a little, while, a little while later in the show. Sounds good. How okay. about you? Have a good Easter? I did, and the 35th wedding anniversary. Oh, well, and, congratulations. Uh, yeah, it was really fantastic. We spent it down in Vancouver Island. So Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. All right, our top stories from The Observer. Five city councillors have been served and supporting local volunteers. Right. And coming up later in the show, I have another conversation with George Young and mm -hmm. Susan McNeil's back with another segment of Stop, Shop, and Save in Quinnell. Great. Look forward to that. Okay, so here at Q Today, we bring you the recent news from the Quinnell Caribou Observer, and we also bring you our own stories from the community. So let's move right on to the news here with Nate. Okay. Five city councillors have been served with a petition for in judicial review issued by the BC Supreme Court. You may remember that some citizens were particularly irate over John Stesek, our former city manager's severance package. Well, Stesek was paid over $170,000 to go after sir, to go after serving only a year uh, as a chief executive officer for the city. The city had a choice to either find cause for, uh, and that's a legitimate reason for letting him go, mm -hmm. or pay in lieu of notice and provide three months uh, pay. But according to the Observer article, Stesek was terminated for cause. And after discussions, some discussions here and there, but that we're not, we're not sure exactly what happened, uh, the amount of $170,000 was agreed upon. However, the May media release said that the former city manager had resigned for personal reasons. All right, I recall. All right, yeah. The five mm -hmm. petitioners, Sylvia Bartley, Wade Bentley, Larry Dunn, Battley rather, Larry Dunn, J Jean Delinas, Jan McKinney, Wally McKinner, <coughs> and Excuse Linda me. Buxton in in in, in the case in this case say that there was uh, say that the media release was therefore false. Okay? Right. In addition, they maintained that council had not discussed the issue. They wanted the councillors who voted for the motion to authorize $170,000 to be personally responsible and also pay the cost of the proceedings. So the respondents have 21 days to file a response and any other counterclaim, Allison. And uh, I just wonder about um, what about the, the mayor? What about the Councillor Tapar? Were they involved in this discussion? Because only five of the seven people are mentioned in this lawsuit. But I'm sure there's going to be a lot more yeah. that we're hearing on this. Yes, we'll, that's for sure. We'll keep you posted here on right. Q Today. All right, the communities of Bushy Lake and Parkland are working together to celebrate volunteerism and plan appreciation events during National Volunteer Week coming up April 21st to the 27th. Now, at the March 22nd CRD Board of Directors meeting, the board approved the allocation of up to $2,000 from the Electoral Area B Special Projects Fund. And these funds are to support national, national Volunteer Week events for the purchase of promotional materials and celebratory items. Now, the Parkland and Bushy Lake communities extend a hearty welcome to all volunteers within the greater community to come out, get involved, and participate in these events. There are many ways that you can participate. Residents can let the Commission know what interests you, uh, a short-term or ongoing project, or at the grassroots level by assisting with organizing the events. Now, information on these events is available on the Bushy Lake Parkland Volunteer Appreciation Facebook site. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Great going. So check it out. Right. Okay, as of April 1st, the HST is dead. And long live the GST and PST. <laughs> We're going back to them. And there are some pros and cons. You know, from a consumer point of view, there, uh, there are greater exemptions. For example, mm -hmm. haircuts, bike, restaurants, and some labor will be exempted. Yeah. In, uh, in, in total, according to NDP finance critic Bruce Ralston, uh, the average family will be about $350 a head per year. Wow. But on the con side, Elson, mm -hmm. it's a little, it's more administration work for small business. You know, two sets of books instead of one. That's right. Uh, also, low income people will no longer get their quarterly rebate checks. In the Observer editorial that uh, was uh, next to the, uh, there was a news story and then there was an editorial on the subject, mm -hmm. the black press emphasized the immensity of the bungle by former Premier Gordon Campbell 
and many economists say, say that the harmonization wasn't a bad idea, but the way it was done, mm -hmm. that was the problem. And I know? totally agree. Yeah. I think a lot of people would, yeah, for I, sure. You know, bringing things together is fine, but yeah. how do you do it? It came on the heels of an election that saw no mention of a change in policy. In fact, the liberals said they weren't interested in doing so previously. Mm -hmm. So in the end, the poor will see a rebate drop from up to $230 a year to just 75 And according to the editorial, the most vulnerable feel the shift most keenly. Meantime, the rest of us will adjust as we always do. True okay. that. Okay. Thanks, Nate. Well, Annie Gallant wrote a story for Wednesday's Observer about the Quinnell Clu Canoe Club, formerly the Dragon Lake Paddlers. Uh, both the club and their two dragon boats are on the move. The club is moving the boats to Pioneer Park once the boathouse that they're currently fundraising to build is completed, and that's expected before the end of season this year. Uh, with the new boathouse, they can permanently house the boats and equipment in a secure facility with protection from the elements. Now, the club has also changed its name to the Quinnell Canoe Club from Dragon Lake Paddlers, as I mentioned, and they're hoping to attract new members. They currently have about 38 competitive paddlers and about the same number of recreational paddlers, which offers the same benefits, but of course without the competitive component. Now as the club grows, they're looking to add other flat water racing vessels, such as kayaks and canoes. And the club is open to youth, adults, men, women. Uh, competitive practices are Tuesday and Thursday from 6 p.m. until 7.30 at 1815 Beach Crescent Road and recreational and drop-in paddling is Wednesday nights, same time, 6 to 7.30 at the same address, at least until the new boathouse is uh, built mm -hmm. at Pioneer Park. So if you're interested in trying paddling or if you're inclined to join the club, uh, you can see them at Central Registration at the Arts and Rec Center, April 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. or contact Marcia Swanson at 992-6713. And Marcia is also able to answer any questions that you may have about the sport of paddling. It's a great sport. Mm-hmm. Ever tried it? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, good. But not with them. But yeah, I, not uh, the dragon I have boat paddled. type thing. Yes. Yeah. Good on you. Moving on to s other sports. Let's take. Uh, let's talk about the Nationals. Allison. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Look at this. Look at this baby right here. What is this, Allison? That is a uh, silver medal for the Canadian National Wheelchair Curling Championships that my team and I um, are proud to have brought home from Ottawa Congratulations, this week. fist pump, Thank lady. you. <laughs> Thanks, okay. we did a lot of that in the last week. <laughs> yeah, well congratulations, you really deserve it. Tell us a little Thank bit you. about it, eh? Let's, what happened? Let's uh, oh, get on, silver, You know what, Nate, I could, I could talk for, for hours because we just had such a fantastic week in, in Ottawa. The curling was great. Uh, getting to see the other teams, the camaraderie. I mean, you go out on the ice and you compete and you come off the ice and you go have a drink together. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we got to do a little bit of sightseeing. So right. all in all, town. yeah, fantastic week. And to bring yeah. home uh, a medal is, we're extra proud. So. Yes. And um, the, 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 let's hear the names of your teammates so that we could uh, honor them too. For sure. My skip is from Langley. His name's Gary Cormack. And our third, Frank LeBounty, is from Prince George. Second, Vince Miele is from Richmond, and our alternate, Samantha Sue, also from Richmond. Okay. So. Yes, and I... And Coach Karen Watson. Sorry, I shouldn't forget okay. her. <laughs> you know what? I just uh, know that there's something else, though. There was another award given, and I know you're very modest, but <laughs> tell us uh, about this other award. Well, I, I couldn't be more proud. Frank LeBounty mm. from Prince George, our third, and myself uh, actually made the all-star team. Uh, for the whole event, so to be honored like that was fantastic. Thrilling. Two fist pumps. <laughs> One, two. No, that's yeah. fantastic. You worked so hard on this, Allison. I think all of us at Q today uh, and QMag, and we're so proud of you. And Quinnell should oh. be proud of you too. You, you've done it. Thanks, you've mate. You've done. It. And you know, just a, a little it. thing there. You've got your vest on too. I right? do. I got my vest. Yeah. I'm proudly wearing. Yeah. Yes. And so. blue colors from, from British Columbia. That's right. Yeah. Well, what's next? 
Uh, well, we're done for the season. Mm -hmm. Usually, as usual, I get back from nationals and the club here is closed. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple minutes or a couple months, few months to rest and relax and get back into things in the fall. See okay. how it goes. Well, congratulations again. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, I really I appreciate it. <laughs> so. All right, now as uh, Nate mentioned earlier, Susan McNeil is back with her segment on home-based businesses, Stop, Shop and Save in Quinell. Welcome Quinell, I'm Susan McNeil and I'm here today with our home-based business segment. We have with us Laura Ensmenger. Thank, Thank you for coming. <laughs> Laura Thank is you. with the Sweet Tree Ventures Company, that's her name of her home-based business, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the birch syrup and some of the barbecue sauces and recipes that she has um, with her business. So Laura, tell us a little bit about how you actually got started. Well actually I originally um, sent my husband to a workshop for his birthday because he loves outdoors things. And he came home with a couple spiles and a couple buckets and he said, you know, we should do this. And so we kind of decided, okay, we'll go check out some used equipment that was for sale. And um, when we did, we decided to purchase it and that got us started. We were looking to diversify. Um, it was the time of the BSE and it was time to look at something different and this seemed to fit in with our program. So. So a spile, yeah. could you explain to our viewers what a spile is? Okay, <laughs> it's similar to maple. Um, you, with the trees, you drill a hole, um, you put what is called a spile, and, and what it does is it allows the sap to drip through okay. it into a bucket. Okay. And so that's basically what you do when you're tapping the trees. Um, and we, last year, it was our fourth year doing it, we did 2,000 trees um, on our farm. And um, this year we're planning on doing the same thing. It's our fifth anniversary. So, Way to go. Yep. <laughs> and we're, so we're, we're hoping to continue to grow. Yeah. Awesome. And so Laura, tell us how, um, you, you're, you're labeled as British Columbia's birch syrup. Um, can you tell us if birch syrup is available in other parts of British Columbia? Where do you uh, sell to? Yes, it is. Um, a big part of it, I sell down in Vancouver um, and uh, Victoria, but I have it right along, sort of all the way down there in okay. some specialty stores, little niche stores. Um, I sell it right here in Quesnel, uh, Prince George, and I'm hoping to work further north to find some retailers who would like to purchase it and have it in their stores. So can you tell me, is there, is there a, obviously there's a great need for, a great demand for birch syrup, and I'm wondering um, how many birch farms um, per se are in the province that, that are working at this? Um, in the province, um, I'm not sure exactly. I know there is another one in Quesnel, and um, there's a few a little bit further north, one more down south. I do know that across Canada, there's only about 13, maybe 14 producers of birch syrup. So it's a fairly oh, new wow. thing. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of hard work, intensive labor. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Yeah. It's so different than maple too. Like it's a mm -hmm. lot different to make. Um, oh, I see. Okay, and I have and I do buy your syrup frequently, and I do take it to uh, when I travel and I take it down to my cousins in the states uh, quite often. I do see though that you did tell us that uh, the food trends for 2012 that birch syrup was um, number one for a, a, a trending food product. Yes, they mentioned uh, birch syrup as uh, num one of the one number one trending products. And actually it was one of the top 10 in BC last year for the top products. And um, I know at Edible Canada, um, when the Olympics were on, mm -hmm. it was one of their top products that they sold was my syrup there. So I now see as being a top product, you, birch syrup can be used and in, incorporated into other products. So you brought with you today some barbecue sauce. And yes. this is actually gluten-free, so for those people who yeah. are the gluten-free folk, uh, it is available and you have several places around Quinell that this is available at? Yes, and actually at other stores as well. Okay. Um, and it's a recipe that I come up with myself mm. and um, it has been well received. It's very good on ribs, um, chicken, wings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because it's gluten free. It's a product that is going really well for people who have like celiac yes. disease. Yeah. Right. 
And so that's always nice to see in a home-based product that yeah. you actually can diversify and, and make products that are uh, suitable for all people in the, in the market. Yep. So I see you've actually created a cookbook called Cooking with Liquid Gold. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about how this came about? Um, originally, when we first started the syrup, everyone hadn't heard of it, even mm -hmm. in Quenelle. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that? And we're like, um, basically, we could relate to it because we didn't know what it was five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so they were asking, what do I do with it? And we had to keep going over and over. And we decided, well, I'm going to make a cookbook. And so I got a lot of the folks from Quenell yes. to give me their recipes if they wanted to, and the to chefs, um, like um, Eric Pateman, Randy Jones, a mm -hmm. lot of the top chefs gave me their recipes. Lovely. And stuff that I have made, um, so we incorporated it in there. Um, we also have a little bit about how to tap a birch tree, so if you ever want to tap one in your backyard and make your own syrup, mm -hmm. um, it, it tells you a bit about how to do that. Fabulous. Um, it's a first time effort and, and it'll give you lots of good ideas, like even from biscuits to butter tarts, um, vinaigrettes, it's got all kinds of good recipes in there. So can you tell me what color birch syrup is when it's tapped? It's clear like water. Okay. It's wonderful to drink. It's really? got a bit of a sweet taste. Um, not a whole lot because birch syrup only has up to about 0.5% sugars. Oh, okay. Um, it's different than maple. Maple has a higher percent. Um, that's why with birch syrup, it takes 100 gallons to make one gallon of birch oh syrup. Oh my goodness. That's a, lot, that's a lot of syrup. It is. <laughs> and it's a lot of cooking. Um, it also has a different sugar. Uh, fructose is its main sugar, where maple is glucose and sucrose, so okay. the cooking is different. Yes. Um, the way you use it is different. It's similar okay. to the way you use molasses okay. or honey, yes. that sort of thing okay. in your baking or cooking. Um, it has a lot of um, really good minerals in it, like manganese, magnesium, okay. calcium. It's even got some iron and zinc. Um, probably depending from where you tap your trees. Okay. Um, but in this area we have, that's what we have. Awesome. Um, it's also considered diabetic friendly um, because of the sugar in, the t type of sugar. The type the of sugar that it yeah. is. Yes. It's considered diabetic friendly, which, um, okay. which a lot of people find really useful. Yes, I'm yeah. sure they do. Well, well, there's a very diversified uh, product on the market here in Quenelle and uh, I'm really glad that you came in and shared some of this information with us because I don't think a lot of people really um, understand the whole chemical process and, and what's involved in the birch syrup. So it, it obviously caters to a wide variety of people with different health needs. So Laura, before mm -hmm. we go, I'd like you just to let our viewers know where we can get hold of you at, um, either Facebook, um, web page, okay. phone number, um, if you just let our viewers okay. know, that'd be great. Um, you can contact me, I have a website up, it's um, www.sweettreeventures.com um, or you can phone me, it's 250-249-5466 uh, um, or if you go on the website you'll see a lot of the different stores where you can just go and purchase it. And purchase it. Yeah, or oh. email me from there Okay. and I'll be glad to either send it to you, ship it to you, or <laughs> if you want to carry it in your store I'd be more than welcome to talk to you about it. Um, and I'm hoping that um, not just with the birch syrup but with other products as well that people will shop more local, use more of the local products. Um, it is a new trend out and um, we're hoping to fit into that trend and hopefully everyone will support the small businesses out there. Okay. Well, thank you, Laura. I really appreciate you coming today and that's great information for us. Uh, we are looking at other opportunities to bring local markets together and I did know that we spoke a little while ago about um, an opportunity called the Feast of Fields, which we will uh, go into at a later date, but um, I'm, I'm sure you'll want to participate in that. Oh, sure. As well, and we can encourage other um, folks to do it too. So yes. thanks, Quinnell, for, for visiting with us today. Yep. Thanks for having me on. Perfect. Appreciate it. Well, George Young is back, and today he speaks with me as he travels up to, up to <laughs> Quinnell. We've had a long trip, but very interesting but from his old photographs. Let's take a look at uh, Nate in conversation with George Young.
Hi. Hi, George. How, How are you? Hi, Nate. How are you doing? Very good. Yeah. It's great to see you. Yeah, it's been a while since we've been on here, eh? Yeah, yeah it's, it's been a little bit while, yeah. yeah. And uh, I thought that what we would do is continue your trip, of course, and uh, we'd get right up to close to Quinnell today, and then we'll have a, a break, and our next show will be the last show where we kind of get you ready to grow up in Quinnell. Because right. right now you're a little kid just coming back back in the dark ages, right? Right, yes. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, let's do a little recap on the meteorite. Okay, yes. Okay, we had a mystery last time and we told the, uh, we secret? told, yeah, it was a sec secret. So let's uh, tell us more. Okay, a long time ago, back in the probably 1920s or whatever, my grandparents had talked about flying over Winds Lake, which I have a picture of above there. Yeah. And they were talking about, they'd seen a, a meteorite or something coming through the, like you can see the red coming through the sky here. Right. And so they followed it up in the plane and they've seen where it landed here. Right, and we yeah. see some and, yellow. And when it landed, it's the, those yellow things is, is really red, really hot there and it just set fire to all the forest and set fire to everything, eh? Now the pictures that I have is only approximately two inches big and I blew it up and uh, you can see in the background how the, everything's burnt. And there's two holes in the front of it here. Right, right. And, and if you look over on the opposite page here, you can see the same two holes here, eh? Okay, now, yeah, I, could, I see what you're saying. The two yeah. holes are probably the same as the same. Uh, so I believe it's the same, yeah, same yeah. thing. But anyway, when you come up to this uh, at Beaver Mouth there, right. at the campground, this rock, it just looks like a big rock. But when you get up to it, you can see how close it is, or like how interesting it is on the bottom portions, eh? Yeah. And the middle picture here, if you want to see, show them that little rock there. Yeah, oh, this, right, this right, is a, right. This was underneath on the bottom of it here, and it's really, really uh, light, isn't it? Yes, There's it's no very light. Yeah, yeah really. it's white, just completely burnt. So this could, could have come from the sky. Uh, well, Way that's what everybody uh, yeah. says, eh? Mm, okay. But then anyway, we followed this thing for a mile and a half, and it just made a trough down, so it everything kind of fits for it. Yeah, but right. anyway, whether it is a meteorite or not, I don't really know, except that it, uh, I don't. <laughs> okay. But whether it is or isn't, I yeah. mean, it's it's easy access. You can drive right to it, and, and wait, Nate, if you want to tell them how to get to it. All right, you there. go to Beaver Mouth Campground, cross a bridge, turn right on the road at just a short distance, and you will see it on the right-hand side, just uh, by the just by the side of the road. Wow. Okay. Yep. Well, Mr. Tourism, thank you very much. Yes. And someday, you know, maybe we should get a scientist there and check it out. And well, see. I imagine they're already there already. But All right. Probably Good idea. Looking, yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for doing that. Now we got to get back to you the story of your life. Right. Okay. And last time. It's around 1952. Yes, and we're coming back from Lewis Minister now, uh -huh. heading back to the Caribou, and we're heading into, we're coming in, we're just leaving Williams Lake now. Right. And uh, we're coming up the old Soda Creek Road, and this is the old uh, PGE r Railway Station at right. Williams Lake. It's still uh, standing there? Yes, it's still standing there, yes. Uh -huh. And that Rocky Point Ranch was 35 miles south of that. These rocks are part of that same rocks that on the ranch that uh, Ice Age had brought down according mm -hmm. to some of the people that know a lot more than me. Yeah. And we're coming down the old road there into Soda right. Creek. Yeah, let me just, oh, I got this a little bit. Let me just get this. All right, there we go. Okay, now we're coming into Soda Creek here and uh, there's a little island right uh, there and there's a little cabin yeah. on the thing right there. Yeah, beautiful to area, yeah. isn't and, it? And yeah. this is the first time that I met these people then it was uh, Krauss's, Donnie, Lorraine, and Sylvia, and they had a couple little girls about my age, and they were oh. girls that grew up as, and they had the flour mill at, at, at uh, Soda Creek, and wow. uh, it, it burned down in 1944, but before that time, the, 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 the uh, stones that used for grinding the rocks, yeah. it, or I mean grinding the cereal, right. is now was taken down to Rogers Flour Mill in Armstrong. Oh, really? Yeah, so they oh. were the beginning of it. Eh? So there we crossed the wow, bridge. Amazing! I didn't know that. So in the 1940s, early 40s, we were making flour here. Okay. Great. Now we crossed the bridge at Soda Creek itself. Mm -hmm. This is the old bridge there, mm -hmm. goes across there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we get into Soda Creek, there used to be a, about 4,500 people lived there. Really? And this here is a picture of the old jail that used to be there, and it still has. The, you can see the bars in there, right? Right. Yeah. Wow. Now the stern wheelers all came up here, and this is uh, the hotel in front of. the of uh, Soda Creek, uh -huh. where the st where the stagecoach came, and this uh -huh. is where they loaded all the 
all the uh, stern wheelers all came in there and they were actually built them there, eh? Right. And, uh, and these are a couple of girls standing in front of the building, in front of the door here, showing you our, and this sort yeah. of works inside the building. And right, then this exactly. is an old wagon. It. You can see how new it is, and that just came off the old stern wheeler. Wow, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Some of these, uh, now these pictures, pictures here, are fantastic. this is a stern wheeler, and this one's called the BX. Literally. And if you go to uh, Billy Barker and Quinnell, you can see these pictures, except you don't see pictures like this, because I have pictures inside the steering wheel, and not just the outside pictures. And these two fell fellows here are standing beside the pipe there. Do you see mm -hmm. it up there? Mm -hmm. And then this is the back of where it's spinning the water. Right. And this is where it's on the river, and you can see there's a bear or, or moose or something there. Now, when we're inside the stern wheeler on the yep. bunk beds. Now, these are real pictures inside the stern wheeler. Right, and this is in this part, I understand this is to be in this part in here. Now, if you look through the window, you can see, mm -hmm. you can see the back of the old hotel in the background there. Right. And then here's a couple other stern wheelers you can see through the window, see? Wow, amazing. Yeah. And then this there. is where they're unloading freight here. Yeah. And there was a sole tractor they unloaded there at the time that uh, my grandparents were there and then they use it on one of the right. farms well, down through there. And there's a, there's a traditional picture that we see, yeah. yeah. So let me just ask you a little bit before we go on be, be after the stern wheeler. Have you ever thought of uh, rebuilding the st a stern wheeler? Ever? Oh, I mean, no, I, no, no that's, a, that's a whole different ball game, yeah. Is it t yeah. too different for you? Oh, I mean, I you're pretty so. skillful. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, there were some little replicas made of them and stuff like that that people have made that, that's been really accurate, I think. It okay. could be in the museum or something. Okay. And okay, then, of course, ahead. there used to be like a lot of houses there, but I had Super 8 movies of this stuff, but it all got destroyed, and you can see the black line on top. But this is the old uh, community hall where everybody mm -hmm. used to go in there and stuff. Right. And this is inside the stern wheeler, just a couple of pictures of, and then you can see the wood pile just on the back corner of it there. Right. And this here, the Krauses, when that, when they, that um, flour mill burnt down, they made a boat 35 feet long and used to oh, deliver yeah, freight yeah. with that thing up the, the boat. with the Fraser River, yeah. Yeah. How old is this picture? Do you have any idea? Well, it would be about 1953 or something wow. like that. Wow, unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, we're still in Soda Creek. And we're coming up from Soda Creek, and there's a little native village that they had down there for the tourists to come to. Yeah. And this and is they a still course. have that. Yes, they still have that. Hot soul. And then this is a, a place where I think, I don't know why that's a hot house or sort of where you can go down there and have steams or whatever. And there's the monument in, in Williams Lake, or I mean Soda Creek that my dad put up. Oh, he did that, eh? Right, and this is the winch that they used to pull the stern wheelers up onto the shore in the winter time and stuff. And the old winch and all that kind of stuff. 100 years, 1858, so the In 1958, was. yeah. Right? Centennial wow. year, yeah. Wow. And uh, these are just a so couple. So it's 150 years now. Yeah, these are just some of the pictures that yeah, used to the be there. Yeah, the church is there. Yes. The church is still standing, isn't and it? And then look at this old car. Eh? It's funny. It, it's a funny car. It, it has. And this Cruiser. here is, is Mrs. Jenkins' place, and she used to talk in the telegraph tail, uh, trail, tape, telegraph line to my dad mm -hmm. by Morris Code. Wow. And this is uh, Mrs. Jenkins' place, and she was a land landmark for that whole area, and they did a lot of stuff for that for the different people in that yeah, area there. Sorry. Okay, all right, Morris, is this still no, Soda Creek? Yeah, this is still Soda Creek. Now this is uh, the old Rumley tractor that they they had to take the lugs off it there to put it on the steering wheel so it wouldn't wreck the floor when they brought it up to drop it off at Soda Creek. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I had a lot of other pictures of it. But anyway, as we're going along the Fraser River and you look down and here is uh, 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 somebody built this castle for his wife, and I guess he didn't have rocks in it. So, but you can see the structure yeah, of yeah. maybe a, uh, of an old castle, and he used boards. But it's kind of strange, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a little break here, George, and when we come back next week, uh, we'll continue toward Quinnell. Okay. Okay. Thank All you. right. Great. And as always, thanks to the Quinnell Lions for helping to make our show possible. And remember, you can watch us anytime on the web at QCATV.ca, QCATV.ca, or check us out on Facebook, Big Q, Big T, all one word. <laughs>